Turn in your Bibles, if you would, to 1 John chapter 3. And we'll read verses 16 to 18. By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. This is God's holy word. Amen. You be seated. And let's pray again. Lord, we do pray as we open your word that you would speak to us, that you would cause us to see the glory of these truths. Help us, Lord, to be convicted where we need conviction, and help us, Lord, to be encouraged where we need encouragement. We pray for your blessing on this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, church history has come to view the Apostle John as the Apostle of Love. The apostle of Love. And we, we might think that fits, but that wasn't always a fitting title for John, the Apostle of Love. Remember that John and his brother James were the sons of of thunder. They were nicknamed the Sons of Thunder. John wanted to call judgment down on the Samaritans. Remember that story? He argued with the others about who was the greatest disciple. He even tried to stop others one time from casting out demons because they weren't part of his inner circle. Somewhere along the way, though, John did become the Apostle of Love. He was the beloved disciple of Christ. You hear that title in the Gospel of John. He's the disciple that Jesus loved, his beloved. He, along with Peter and his brother James, experienced things with Jesus that no one else got to experience. Things like the transfiguration. John was close at hand during the crucifixion. We don't hear that about any other disciple. But there he is at the foot of the cross, and Jesus even calls out to him and to his mother Mary during his time on the cross. And what does he say? He says, woman, behold your son. And he says to John, behold your mother. John, it seems, also lived the longest of all the apostles. And he wrote his letters, his gospel, and the apocalypse last of all. It seems that John was privileged to have the final word for the canon of God's scripture. He's the, he's the final writer of scripture, the last gospel, the last book. It was John from John's pen. But when we consider what John wrote in his gospel and in his letters especially, the title of the apostle of love makes a lot of sense. John, the fierce, dogmatic, ambitious son of thunder, has become the apostle of love. He was transformed and sanctified by God's gracious work. And as we study 1 John, we still see the boldness. We still see the black and white dogmatism at times. But we also see the affection, don't you? What does he keep calling the church? Little children, my dear children, beloved. We see the care. And we see the focus on love as his great theme. In the gospel, in his letters, it's always there, this focus on love. Our passage today is no, no exception. Here in chapter 3, John has been referring um, the, to the command that Jesus taught his disciples and that John had been teaching the church from the beginning. This comes from John 13, 34 and 35. These are Jesus' words. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. And as John goes on, he doesn't just command this again, but he also uses this command as a mark for true Christian faith. He says this love is a mark of the true people of God. He said in our, our last passage, we read last week and preached on, we know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. So our love for one another in the church 
It's the distinguishing mark of being born again. It's the distinguishing mark of a true Christian faith. So John's not done with commanding us to love one another. He's not done with giving us the test of love. In our passage today, John shows us what love looks like. He shows us what love looks like. This is true love. By this we know love. Now, just a way of context again, we've often used these three tests that John gives, and we know we're in the third test right now. But just to refresh you, there's the theological test, if you know God, do you believe the truth? There's the moral test, do you obey the truth? And then there's the social test, do you love in truth? And you might have noticed that I always ruin the, the nice, you know, the nice uh, uh, rhyming of it by saying, believe the truth, obey the truth, and then I say, love in truth. I, I change the wording. Well, I do that because that's exactly the text. In John's wording, this is where I get this wording from as our passage today. If you look at, um, if you look at verse 18, you see it says, Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. Let us love in truth. That's the test. Let us love in truth. Now, I'm going to follow Martin Lloyd-Jones here, the great English preacher of last generation. Um, he, when he preached this text, he preached it backwards. He starts with verse 18, then we'll go to verse 17, and then we'll go to verse 16. That makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? Going backwards? No, not usually. Why would he do that? Why would I want to do that? I, I think this is one of those times where we're running up against John thinks differently than we do. And he comes around ideas in a circular way. And sometimes he comes around them backwards to us. So I think it's helpful to look at it the other way. So what, what John does is he gives us the highest example of love in Christ. Then he gives us a lower, more practical example of love, caring for each other's needs. And then he states the principle. I'm, we're going to flip it, and we're going to go through it the other way around. We're going to start with the principle. We're going to see how that's applied among us. And then we're going to look and finish off on a high note, hopefully, on the love of Christ for us. And look at the highest and most perfect example of love. So let's look again at verse 18. Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. And the main point here, this is the main point of this whole passage, is that we are called to love in truth. Let us love in truth. If you hear nothing else, hear that God wants you to love in truth. And we're going to talk about that more, but what we're going to see is when we define what that means, we're going to learn more about what love is, what that looks like. What does it mean to love in truth? Well, you look at verse 18. Love is true if it is expressed. Love is real if it goes beyond mere words and does something, and actually does something. To love in truth is to act in love for one another, not to merely say that you love one another, or think about loving one another, or to agree that it's a good thing to love one another, you have to do it. You have to actually love one another in action. So this, this leads us to our first sub-point of what is love? What does love look like? First of, all, first of all, love is a verb. Love is a verb. That might sound cute and trite, but it's a, what I'm trying to say is love is an action word. And that's exactly what John is saying here in verse 18. We've already noted it, but look, look again. Let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. In deed means in action. It means in doing. Let us not love just by saying things. Let's love by actually doing stuff. We need to do stuff to actually love, to actually be loving. Think about it. Stay, stuff like... Staying late at work to help a coworker or to help your boss, or giving up your evening to welcome someone in, hosting people at your house at, at your own expense, giving some money to a friend in need, letting someone else take the best seat to watch the movie, babysitting for your friend, giving unexpected gifts, praying for one another, asking someone how they're doing and really meaning it, giving someone your time, giving someone your energy, giving someone your help. 
Love is a verb. Love's a verb. It's not just a feeling that we have deep in our hearts. It's not warm fuzzies. Love is not some abstract commitment that we hold to technically. Just saying I love you doesn't make it so. Love's a verb. That's true love. Now let's look up now to verse 17. We're going to see another thing about love. That is that love is open-hearted. Love is open-hearted. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? How does God's love abide in him? No, you see that? The description, if you, if you do not help your brother, the description is that you closed your heart to the brother. You closed your heart. If you see this need and you close your heart, you know, the brothers and sisters in the church, they don't always advertise all of their needs and all of their troubles and all of their prayer requests. They might not disclose to you that they're in dire straits financially or that they really need prayer for something that they're struggling with or that they're overwhelmed and they need help. They don't always disclose that on the surface. So what do we need to do? We need to draw that out of people. We need to open our hearts to other people's lives. And we might, we might look at someone and they look good on the outside and so we, and we just say, you know what? I can't be bothered. I don't, I don't have time. I, have, I hardly have time for my own problems, let alone that guy's problems. And so we close our heart. We just kind of say, you know, I could open my heart to this person and share and, and hear their heart, but I, I don't want to. So John describes it as opening your heart. Now, to really, so what this is saying is to really love your brothers and sisters, you need to know them. You need to know them. See that description? The description is not you took down their prayer request and, and you, and all that. It's no. You opened your heart to them. The opposite of it, the opposite of love is that closing your heart to them. Closing your heart. So sometimes we're not, like I said, sometimes we're not up for that. You know, we're just simply not up for other people's problems. But that should not be the case in the church. See what John's saying? He's calling for a radical love that brings you out of selfishness, brings you out of this self-interested way of living and that's so common. You know, just think of the sea of faces when you go downtown or when you're in an event or you're in a shopping mall or something. You see that sea of faces. Everyone, headphones on, head down, in the phone, doing their own thing. That shouldn't be the case in the church. That shouldn't be the case in the church. We should not be only concerned about doing our own things. We shouldn't be concerned only with our own hearts. We should be opening our hearts to others, hearing their needs. You know, some people want to come to churches. So I think some people go to big churches, at least back in the day they did, because they could blend in. They could just blend in, hide, sit in that back pew, sneak out, sneak in, sneak out, and not be known, and not have to know others. You see that? Now, is that what John's calling this church to do? He's calling them to do the opposite. He says, no, 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 none of that. None of that sneaking in, hiding your heart, holding it close. I'm calling you to do something radical. I'm calling you to open your hearts to these people. But I don't like those people, John. Open your heart to those people. You know, love, loving and liking aren't the same thing. Remember, you know, the world defines love in all sorts of wrong ways. That, you know, love means good feelings and love means uh, getting what I want and feeling good and all that. That's not what love is. We're already, we're defining love right now that, no, love is, is true. It's, it's in the truth. It's action. It, it results in us being open-hearted to others and actually meeting the needs of others, right? So love isn't just these good feelings. Right? No, love isn't that. But we're, we're hesitant to love people like this. But John's calling us to this radical way of love. He's saying, get, get your eyes up off of yourself and look at who God put in your life. Look who God put in your church. Look at your brothers and sisters. 
Consider their needs. Open your heart to them. Love is open-hearted. Love pursues others. Love pursues others. Think about this. In a, in a conversation, how much do you learn about the other person? How much did you, so let's think of a recent conversation. How much did you learn about the other person? Or did you just tell them about you? You know, I, I've been caught doing that at times where I think, I just downloaded my problems on that person, which is part of the give and take of loving in the body of Christ. There's sometimes where you're going to be the person who needs the love, and other times you're going to be the person who needs to love and needs to show that, that listening ear, opening your heart. But consider that. Are you the type of person who actually asks questions and wants to hear the answer? And you're attentive for how your brother or sister is doing. That's what it means to be open-hearted to the brothers and sisters. You know what makes this really hard? Sin. Sin makes this hard. Being burned by people makes this hard. Why do we close our hearts to people? Well, sometimes just because we're plain old selfish and we couldn't be bothered. But sometimes because we don't want to be hurt again. We don't want to get to know these people and then have it all fade away. We, we trusted that person with some information before and they betrayed our confidence. And, or th this and that. There's all these things that can cause us to be burned. We don't want to be let down. Just think about this. When you see homeless people or, or drug addicts on the street, we often close our hearts to them. We certainly close our wallets, but sometimes we close our hearts. Why do we do that? Well, it might be because of wisdom. We don't want to necessarily help them in their sin and help them in their struggles, right? But that's not really an excuse to not open your heart to them and treat them like a human being, right? Mm -hmm. So why do we often just close in? Well, we've been burned, haven't we? We've seen the $5 immediately get translated into drugs. You say, well, that was a waste. What did I... You know, I've, I've witnessed that. I've given a person money, and I've seen that person later in the day, and th the money has caused them more trouble. And that, you know, you get burned from that. Or you've seen the hours of counseling somebody, the hours of helping someone, just seemingly go to waste. We hesitate. We hesitate to meet the needs of others sometimes out of this fear of being taken advantage of or being let down. Right? We... We want to close our hearts. We don't want to be vulnerable. We, even in the church, we can feel this way. We know that sister's struggling. We know that brother's not doing well. But we mind our own business. We don't want to get entangled. Now, there's a fine line between being nosy and, being, and showing love, right? There is, a, there is a type of person who wants to know all of your business, and it's not motivated by love. Have we met people like that? The perfect person who, who wants to gossip and slander and they just want to know the latest things. That shouldn't be our motivation. But we should open our hearts and we want to know people's hearts. We want to know each other so that we can meet their needs. And that's really the, the next point here. Love meets the needs of others. That's why we open our hearts to them, to meet their needs. We're, we expose ourselves to potential heartache. And, and we, we do this, but we do it to love one another. This is what love looks like. Love is open-hearted. And love meets the needs of others. So again, if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? The answer to that question is, it doesn't. It doesn't. We'll, we can touch on that as well right now. That once again, John is saying again that love proves that God's love lives in you. Your love for others proves that God's really in you, that you abide in him, that you really know him. Love is a test, right? This true love is a proof that you've been born again. But back to the point, what does love look like? It meets the needs of others. Some of you might have a situation that pops right to your mind right now. A brother in Christ who's lost his job, maybe a family struggling to make ends meet, 
a sister overwhelmed with life, financial problems, health problems, spiritual encouragement problems, loneliness problems. Do you know any brothers and sisters with problems? Do you know any needs that need meeting? Here's, here again, John's word to us all. If you have the world's goods and see your brother in need, yet closes your heart against him, how does God's love abide him? Really, the reverse of saying that would be, if you have the means to help and you see a need, love would require you to meet it. True love looks like meeting that need, actually doing something about it. So when you hear your fellow Christian share a need, what should you do? Should you slowly walk away, surreptitiously, trying to disappear? Should you change the topic as quick as you can? Oh, how about those oilers? No. You should open your heart to them. Ask some questions. Try to draw out what the need might be and think about how maybe the Lord is equipping you and calling you to meet it. That's what love looks like actually meeting the needs of your fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. And it's, it's, everyone's mind immediately goes to cash because that's the example that John gives is the world's goods. Do you, and really the word is, do you have the stuff of the world? Do you got world stuff? People need world stuff. You have world stuff. You can meet the needs of these people. That's the example John gives. But it's not only that. That's not their only expression of love. That's a very down-to-earth, practical way. But we can love one another in other ways. People have other needs. They have, they have needs of encouragement, of loneliness. Of, they, have other, they have other practical helps that you can do. And perhaps if you're a little light on the wallet, if your wallet's a little light yourself, you can still love one another. You can still find ways to love one another. So love looks like meeting needs. And we also said love proves that God's love lives in you. The next one, and this is, now we're getting up to the start of the passage, and this is really the, the meat of it. Love is laying down your life. What does love look like? It looks like you laying down your life. That's the phrase. You see that? And we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. We ought to lay down our lives for the brothers and sisters. Love is costly. Do you see that? Love is costly. Love is sacrificial. Love looks like laying down your life. It looks like dying for people. Love looks like dying for people. Do you see that word there? Ought. You see that word ought? That's a strong word. What should you do as a Christian? What does God require of you? What does God expect of you? You ought to lay down your life for your brothers and sisters. Do you want to know what God's will is for your life? You ought to lay down your life for your brothers and sisters. That's God's will. God's will for your life is not for you to avoid entanglements with other people's problems. God's will for your life is other people's problems invading your life and you laying down your life for them. That's God's will for you. God's will for his people, this is strong language, you, you ought, Christian, you ought to lay down your life for the brothers. That's tall. That's a, that is, you don't have to get a taller order than that. Lay down your life for the brothers. It's, God's will is not for you to live for yourself. It's not for you to put yourself first. His will for you is not to just mind your own business only. God's will is for you to spend your life and even give your life sacrificially for other Christians. That's what God wants from his people. That's what love looks like. And you can think of a million ways to apply that. But one thing it certainly means is that you love your brothers and sisters so much that you're willing to give up your very life for them. Do you love anyone that way? If you're a Christian, this is bubbling up in you. God's doing this in you. Remember, John isn't writing to them saying, Hi, I got you. You're not a real Christian. 
John's not trying to give them this test so that they can fail it. He's pointing out that the real Christian has this love. You would, you would suffer for your brothers and sisters. You, if we were, if someone was going to be hauled off to jail, you would try to step in. You would, you would love them. You would say, I'll give my life for that brother, for that sister. Now, this love, this love that is laying down your life, as we get to the start of the passage now, we've gone all the way to the start of it, is perfectly revealed in Jesus Christ. Love is revealed in Jesus Christ, our Savior. Look at those words again. By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us. By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us. So when we're trying to think about what's it going to look like for me to love you, this is who I look to. And this is the moment I look to. Because when did this happen? When did Jesus lay down his life for us? What's John referring to? Even who is, I've been assuming here, but who is he? You look at that, who is he? Well, it's obvious. He's talking about Jesus Christ, the righteous. He's talked about him already throughout this whole letter. How he's the propitiation for our sins. He's the, he's the advocate with the Father. He's the one who has laid down his life for us. He laid down his life to save his people. He's the Lamb of God. He's the bridegroom who came to save his bride and die for her. He's the Savior. He's the Redeemer. He's the hero. He's the dragon slayer. He's the, he's the lonely man who goes into the face of danger with the sword and slays the dragon against all odds. That's who Jesus is. He's the Savior. He's the hero. He's our Redeemer. He's the perfect embodiment of love. He's the quintessence of love. If you want to know what love looks like, you look no further than our Savior Jesus Christ and what he did for his people on the cross. By this we know love, that Jesus took the nails for me, that he took the nails for you, he faced the greatest enemy for you. He died for you. He took on death itself. <coughs> in, John, in John's Gospel, chapter 15, verse 13, Jesus says these words. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. What is the greatest embodiment of love? Laying down your life for your friends, for your people. That's what Jesus did. Think about the road to Calvary. Think about every step of the way. We went through this uh, a few weeks ago, and I won't, I won't refer to the whole thing, but in Philippians chapter 2, you have that, the humbling descent of the Son of God, right? Where, where he didn't count equality with God something to be grasped. He, he, didn't, he didn't remain in heaven, leaving us to die in our sins. He didn't mind his own business up in heaven. He opened his heart to us. And he said, I am going to forgo all my prerogatives of deity, and I'm going to go become a man. And he humbled himself and became a man. That's the Christmas story. That's why it's so glorious, because greater love has no one than this. Because that's the first part of his mission, because what did he come to do? He came to become a man. He humbled himself, becoming like us, becoming a man. Where was he born? In a humble stable. He was born in an animal's feeding trough. You think of the humility of the king of kings descending and being born in that state, but it didn't remain there. The one who made all things began to make little furniture pieces. He humbled himself and became a carpenter. But it gets, it gets even more. Then he was homeless for three years. He humbled himself. And all of this is, is part of him loving the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. This is the love of God every step of the way. From the manger 
all the way through his ministry to the cross. Think of Jesus, the Holy One. He could have called down angels. He could have called down all the power in the world to stop what was happening. But he didn't. And why didn't he do that? Because he loves you. Because he loves you. He loves me. He loved his people. And he was on a mission to save his people. He wasn't just loving us in word or in, in talk. But he was loving in deed. He was loving in truth. Christ came and bore that cross. He took it to Calvary. He willingly let himself be flogged. He willingly let himself be pierced. He willingly let himself die and go to the grave. The crucifixion was not an unfortunate accident at the end of a good life. Jesus didn't find himself in over his head. His death was not a surprise to him. We see this in the Gospel of John, chapter 10. We, we learn again that he laid down his life for us. We have that great passage about him being the good shepherd. He says, I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me, just as the Father knows me. And I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. Do you see the purposeful love of Christ? He purposely laid down his life for you. And that is what we're called to do for each other. To purposefully, committedly lay down our lives for one another. There's no greater love than this. And by this, we know love. There's never been a moment of love like Christ dying for his people. Everything that we've said so far about love, about how we should love, Jesus is the perfect embodiment of it. Jesus loved in truth. He didn't just love in word or talk. He loved in truth. Jesus' love for you was not sentimental. It was not, it was not flippant. It was not subjective. It was real and powerful love. It was actually working for you. It was a deed. It was, he loved you in deed and truth. His love worked for your salvation. He did things. He actually acted on your behalf for your good. That's what love looks like. Doing these things on others' behalf for their good. That's, that's how Jesus loved. Jesus loved us by opening his heart to us in our need. What amazing love of God. That God, who would be just to have punished us all for eternity, opened his heart to us and treated us with love and with mercy and with grace. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Now, Jesus' love for you was not motivated by how lovely you were. <laughs> Spoiler alert, you weren't that lovely. I'm sorry to offend you. Jesus' love was gracious. It was a divine gift. Now, we're supposed to love like that, right? That means that our love for others should be modeled on that type of love. We don't love our brothers and sisters because we like them so much, because they're so lovely, because they're so easy to love and they have no problems or sins or foibles. No, we love them because God's grace compels us to love them. God loved his enemies. You. You were his enemies and he loved you. He loved you. That's how we're to love. We're not only to love the lovely. We're not only to love the likable, those that you get along with. You're called, as a church, to love one another. Period. Full stop. You know, how could we... When we've, when we've received the love of God for ourselves, how could we then treat with contempt the other children of God? Mm. You know, it's, it's the same saying as... We forgive as we've been forgiven. Well, we love, and this is what John says later in our letter, we love because he first loved us. Jesus didn't love us in some selfish way to gain from us. His love displayed perfect selflessness. He came to meet our, our, need, our deepest need. Now, consider these words from Romans 5, 6 to 8. For while we were still weak, 
At the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You see that? By that we know love. By this we know love. While we were enemies, while we were weak, while we were unrighteous, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's his love. Jesus is our great model of love, and he's the power behind our love. And we're going to get to that in chapter 4, that we love because he's first loved us. And last week we got into this as well, that you cannot love unless you've been born again. Unless God's love dwells in your heart, then you have love to give. So we're not just saying, learn from Jesus how to love and imitate him. We are saying that, but it's not that alone. It's be loved by Jesus. And then out of that love, love others. You will not be able to love others unless you first know and experience the love of God in your own life. But praise the Lord as we get to know the love of God, as the love of God transforms us, he gives us the ability to love like him. To love like him. We're called to love like him and to love in him. So let us love in truth. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we, we thank you for this, this passage of scripture, Lord, that teaches us of your love for us, Lord. And we we're called, Lord, to a high calling to, to live a life of love. We pray that you would you'd give us the strength, the ability to do this, Lord, that you would change our hearts where our hearts are still cold. We pray that you would work in us, Lord, and in our midst. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.